So now it's a more focused on one virus rather than a, a large um, or different types of applications. And so here's the basic question I'm interested in. What are we transmitting during a flu season? And so what we're interested in is really looking at what does an infected individual carry as a diversity of viruses. Now we've shown in some of our studies using different platforms that we actually carry a lot of antigenic variants of influenza. We can carry different subtypes, different types of viruses. And we use that information to also look at minor variants that are part of these, what some people call quasi-species. And we can link individuals during epidemics based on the minor variants that they transmit. So in short, what we're transmitting is a swarm. So my interest is really to use this platform to look at the diversity of the viruses within a sample. So here is, a, is all you need to know for flu, is basically it's a, a segmented genome, so different than what Andy showed. And so the length of the reads is not important because the largest segment is only 2.3 kb. Now there are eight segments, and two of those segments, the HA and the NA, are the ones that encode the proteins on the surface. And so when you hear about H3N2 or H1N1, H5N1, it's uh, based on the nomenclature of the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase. So flu does diversity in two different ways. One is because it's an RNA virus, it has an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that has no proofreading function, so very high error. That means that at every replication, there is one mutation per genome. It's a 10 kb genome, about the same size of the VV that we saw. However, there's another way that the virus also does diversity. It's through what's called reassortment. If two viruses co-infect the same cell, then the progeny viruses can have reassorted segments, and then you have brand new viruses. So when we talk about seasonal epidemics, it's usually the uh, genetic drift that we see linked to that error of the RNA. When we talk about pandemics, it's usually because there's reassortment of brand new surface proteins. But today, I'll only talk about the genetic drift for the generation of diverse strain within an individual. So why do we want to use the min-ion? Well, because first it's cool, it's small, right? But it's also because we want to be able to use it in the clinic eventually so that we can determine what a patient is carrying uh, during an infection, but also during an epidemic. So we can also track an epidemic in real time. So really a public health aspect, and we've heard some of that today. So what do we use it for, or what we want to use it for, is to identify mixed infections within a patient, to identify what we will call here the SNVs or single nucleotide variants to link patients together based on what they have transmitted to each other. And we use it for haplotype uh, reconstruction. And I'll show you how some of this has worked so far and where we're going on this part mainly. So first I'll just show you what we did with lab strains because we wanted to make sure it worked for us. And so we had the setup of our experiment and flu is great. Uh, in one sense is that first the segments are small so that when you generate the cDNA, it's really these short amplicons that you're generating. And also that each of the segments have conserved ends. And these are conserved across strains, across subtypes, just not across types. Types being flu A and flu B. But across the flu A, you can use exactly the same primers and amplify everything and capture everything. So this is what it looks like when we do what we call the multi-segment RT-PCR. We get our eight segments for flu A and uh, the eight segments for flu B. And here what we did is a, a comparison because we do regularly sequencing on the MySeq, the ion torrent, not as often, but the PacBio and MySeq. And we use these two platforms in combination as a hybrid. And that's why we want to replace eventually PacBio with the MinION because of the speed and just 
uh, it's far more um, uh, rapid for us uh, to do it. So uh, very quickly, what we saw in just doing the mapping of our reads, and I'm sure you can't see anything much, but it's very colorful. And so here we took our three lap strains, and we just mapped all the reads. And just the main message is that we do get a very nice yield from the min ion and mapping that's very nice. Uh, as we saw in the previous talk, you know, the, the reads map really well to a reference, right? But here's uh, one of the issues for us is that this is taking exactly the same segment. We use exactly the same MRT-PCR product on all four platforms, so they're really uh, easy to compare. And so you can see one of the issues is all these platforms make errors. That's, that's fine. Uh, but of course, we know there are more errors with the MinION. But mostly, it's that uh, it, uh, in homopolymer regions, there is a systematic error that can be a problem, even for the consensus, right? But that's OK. We're trying to work around that. But our main comparisons are often with PacBio, just because we use it for our haplotyping and determining the strain diversity. So uh, we use the two kits. We have the old kit originally, so the, the MAP5. And what we saw there is that even at the consensus, so these are just the reads mapped for each segment for each of the three viruses we tested. And these little black dots here are actually deletions, which we ignore. And these would be the errors. Here I call them SNFs, but they're actually errors in the consensus. Now, it doesn't seem like much, just one error for a full genome per genome. But that's a big error for an RNA virus, because remember that one mutation is enough to uh, represent the error rate that the RNA makes. That means in the evolution of the virus, one error means something uh, when you do then the phylogeny of the virus. And in some uh, uh, of the subtypes, we actually had two errors. But then we used the MAP6, and it corrected a lot of the errors so that we actually were able, in two different other viruses, we used to get no errors at all. So the consensus is pretty good, and I know it's used mainly that, that way for a lot of the uh, virus studies. Now, for clinical samples, that's what we're interested in mainly. And as I mentioned before, individuals can be co-infected with a mix of different variants. And so we tested this with our clinical samples. We actually pooled our samples together and then just wanted to see if even at the consensus level, we were able to separate out flu types, flu strains, and flu subtypes. And we got here uh, three errors for one of the clinical samples. This was, again, the MAP5, not the MAP6. Um, but we were able to very easily separate out the different viruses. Of course, we were able, we did some de novo assembly, but mapping to references. So it works pretty well for our first goal, which is separating out the different viruses within an infected individual. But this is what we really want to use it for eventually. And these are just the initial uh, work we've been doing on that. And I see I'm flying through my time here. But so here's the, um, an example of one of the clinical samples where we looked at the uh, performance, where we compared actually the old kit with the new kit. And uh, we uh, compared with MySeq, because the MySeq is really sort of our, our gold standard for the SNVs. So the way we use this for our SNF calls and for determining what people are carrying and transmitting, uh, what we do regularly is we take the Illumina, uh, do the deep sequencing, and identify the frequency of certain SNVs or single nucleotide variants. And these are our minor variants we're interested in. And then, because the reads are so short, we need to phase them into haplotypes. So the first step is to determine how good our SNVs are, how good the frequency is. And so when we compare with the MinION to see whether it, A, captures the same nucleotide as the minor variant at a position where the uh, MySeq has identified a SNV, 
we see that in general, and you may not see the, the shapes of our little um, uh, icons here, but in general, if the SNV was, or the variant was present at below uh, 15%, it would have the wrong nucleotide call, although the frequencies didn't seem too bad, but the wrong nucleotide call. But above 15%, it would actually have the right call. So it's good for the, the sniff calls if they're very high. And we saw some examples this morning where you had like 50% and it can capture things above 50%. So it's not too bad at 15% that it can capture some of our minor variants. But it didn't capture some of the lower variants we have in red here. This is the MySeq. And those minor variants are not captured very well. So capturing the SNVs right now, we're not there yet. And then the second thing we want to do, so here this is an example for one of the clinical samples, but it was worse for another one where the frequencies and the nucleotides were all over the place. But we know we'll be able to get there eventually. And what we want to do, and that's how we use it right now, at a minimum, we'd like to be able to do a hybrid, okay, where we do our call by MySeq uh, to get the accuracy of the SNV. We do this right now when we use uh, this information to determine the genetic diversity within infected hosts. And we've been able to use, to quantify this and look at transmission across uh, a population during an epidemic. Then what we do is to get a really uh, better information on the dynamics of the virus and how the frequency changes of these minor variants. Again, I'm always interested in the minor variants, not in the consensus uh, at all, is to phase it with right now, we use the PacBio, where we use, uh, even though there are errors, which are represented here by little x's, we would be able to phase the SNVs on the same molecules. Right now, we can't do this because the minion is not capturing some of our minor variants below 15%. I think we can do it above 15%. So what we're doing now is uh, we're actually uh, working also with uh, um, Mini, uh, Oxford Nanopore on this. But here first, I wanted to show you that when we compare the read length, again, read length is not super in, uh, important for us. But we are capturing the right read length for all our segments. And the coverage is great. So completely comparable to PacBio. But what we're doing is trying to determine if we can do some error correction on the reads. So we would be able to use it for this hybrid approach and eventually not even hybrid, but solely for uh, haplotyping of our, um, of our variants. And what we're doing here is doing some work where we look at camers and then look at the probability that a certain camer follows another. And for that, we're training an algorithm and all the databases of flu information. There are uh, a lot of information of flu out there. And uh, we're even plugging into our, um, our HMM some aspects of using at the co-occurrence of certain nucleotides to do the error correction. And then looking at the probability that they go together and then do a ranking of the nucleotides. So right now, we're working on this part to do the error correction so that eventually we could do, again, at a minimum, be able to correct the reads enough so we can do the phasing of our SNVs, uh, the minor variants, and at best, eventually, determine our variant populations within the clinical sample solely with um, the minion. And so in summary, the consensus, I think it's there, totally there. It's quick. It's good. With a new kit, uh, I think for fluids, great. Can separate the mixed types, mixed subtypes, mixed strains. So that's totally uh, important. Uh, but for our interest of using this for determining transmission networks and minor variants, uh, there's still some work to be done on error correction, uh, but definite potential. So I'd like to uh, thank um, the two people mainly in the lab who have done this work. Alan Twaddle, this 
debonair guy who's actually at this meeting. Some of you may have met him. And Bin Ju, who's my virologist. And I would like to thank uh, Oxford Nanopore uh, for working with us on this. Any questions? No, the coverage is totally high enough. It's that it's um, very, very noisy. So there, you're getting all kinds of noise, and it's not calling it as the minor variant. It's calling all kinds of nucleotides, but not at the frequency. Um, and so you can't tell what's there. Great. LD, so I, I've got a question for you. Um, I think it was uh, Raul uh, Andino's group out in California. They have a technique where they circularize RNA, and then right. they have a, a rolling RT, which gives you three copies of that RNA. So right. that, that allows you to link if it's a PCR error or sequencing error versus right. a true SNF. Have you thought about integrating that into the workflow? So for the error correction, it would be good to do it as a rolling circle for the min-ion. Mm -hmm. um, the, it's actually a method that, that doesn't work very well. I don't know if you've ever attempted it, but no, very yeah, few people can get to it <laughs> to work. It's, it's very, very hard. That may be the way to go for the min-ion, is a rolling circle approach. Have you uh, tried Jared Simpson's variant caller from, from Nanopolish? Because it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the original polisher for the consensus assembly. OK, uh, so this is a variant color. You call, what is yeah. it called? Yeah, so Jared's now built a module into Nanopolish, which calls oh. variants. So it's, it, well, it uses the same HMM, HMM, but it will call variants. It looks like it would be perfect. OK, so. you know what? I don't know if Alan has tried it. I'll ask him, but thanks for the suggestion. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, Alan, thank, right. thank you very thank much. You. It was great.